Hello, Made to Thrive Nation. I've been waiting for this podcast for a very long time. I've got a multi-billion dollar unicorn of a man here. He started incredible companies and incredible companies to actually serve humanity. And it's a privilege and an absolute honor to have this man on. And I'm so grateful for Sami Inkinen. He's now CEO, founder of Verta Health. We're going to talk about that. He started Trulio many, many years ago. He's a man from Finland that I highly respect. Why? Because he lives by real character and, and virtue. And I I've seen that because he has not compromised on his mission at Verta. Been watching him for a while because I think this is the way of the future. Personal medicine, preventative and proactive medicine and healthcare that does not tap into the sick care model or the sick healthcare model that is currently out there. So welcome to the show, Sami. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Super excited to be here. So let's absolutely talk about obesity and diabetes or how to get rid of them. Cool. Yeah, exactly. And and let's start there. Tell us about the crisis out there. I always sort of frame it under four pillars. And the first pillar is give a reason why people should actually care. You know, what is happening with obesity worldwide or in the US, if you know those figures? What is happening with people being overweight? What is happening with insulin resistance? Because we've got five to 10 minutes to catch this audience and these viewers on YouTube to make sure that they carry on listening. What is happening with this crisis? Yeah, well, I would say... The biggest health epidemic of our generation is type 2 diabetes and obesity, and it's exploding. It's absolutely exploding. So let's just throw some U.S. numbers, and then we can talk about globally. So in America, um, about 10% or 11% of adults have type 2 diabetes. So that's nearly 40 million people. Wow. When you add prediabetes, that's another 100 million. Then if you add obesity and overweight, somewhere around 70% of American adults uh metabolically sick so it, we're talking hundreds of millions of people in america alone obviously globally that would be billions who are metabolically unhealthy and then if you just add or, or look at the type 2 diabetes numbers globally i say i mentioned that in america about 11 percent of adults have type 2 diabetes which is kind of the far end of the metabolic sickness if you if you will um you look at china and india not only do they have 100 million plus people living with type 2 diabetes in both countries separately, but the percentage of adults is around the same figure as in the United States, which is about 11% of adults, which usually blows people's minds away. That yeah. Wait a second. Well, I can imagine that there's probably more people with type 2 diabetes in China than in the US because it's four, four or five times bigger, but the percentage is already about the same as, as in the US. So the net net is nearly half or about half of sort of developed nations adults have type 2 diabetes or so obesity and numbers are only going up and up and up and that's just this is first of all it's sad um people are sick uh the quality of life goes down life expectancy goes down but then furthermore how can we afford to take care of these people from a healthcare cost perspective and in the united states that's already kind of blowing up in our face. So huge, huge, huge problem. I would say it's the biggest problem. And unfortunately, the best that humanity has had to offer in terms of a treatment over the last decade or two is pharmaceutical companies selling drugs to treat the symptom of the disease. And just as an example, and well done, boys and girls, Nova Nordisk is the most valuable company in Europe. Most valuable company in Europe. Wow. And what are they doing? They are selling drugs to treat the symptoms of type 2 diabetes and obesity. So big problem and the quote unquote, the best solution that we've had over the last decade is not really making the problem go away. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I think, what the big problem is that you're solving at Verta is you've seen this now and saying, hang on, and I know that you're not anti-pharmaceutical, so we'll unpack that. But let's just focus on, so 50% of developed countries or first world countries have either got type 2 diabetes or obesity or pre-diabetic, and maybe you want to define what pre-diabetes is so that people understand that when you go into a room, one in two people, 50% of people have a metabolic disease, which is which is huge and significant. Yeah, well, obviously, there's um, a specific clinical markers for the diagnosis of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And one of the most commonly used is the average blood sugar. And it's measured by HbA1c. So uh, in most places, if you go for your annual physical, you have a little simple blood draw. And one of the couple of dozen markers is what's called the HbA1c. 
And so the higher this average blood sugar as measured by HbA1c is, um, it, then it sort of defines the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Um, if it's above 5.7%, you have uh, prediabetes, and it's above 6.5%, you have type 2 diabetes. So uh, that's one measure to um, diagnose prediabetes or, or type 2 diabetes. But you could simply think about it, it as a, a spectrum of metabolic disease. Initially, you may not have a lot of symptoms, but things are already brewing under the hood. Inflammation, elevated blood sugar, elevated insulin. It gets further. You may start to have some symptoms, really fatigue. You can't sleep. You're peeing all the time. You're thirsty all the time. And then it goes further and further, and you may have macrovascular, microvascular complications like tingling in your fingers and toes and kidney issues and eye issues and maybe heart issues. And so it's, it's kind of like boiling water, this old analogy of boiling crap in a water, that the water is getting warmer and warmer, and you kind of don't notice unless you have a thermometer in this case. A blood test in the early phases and in later phases, obviously the symptoms can become, you know, deadly in fact. Uh, but that's kind of how you can think of it. You can think of metabolic disease as a spectrum. Yeah. Um, so I talked about blood sugar and uh, inflammation, um, obesity and overweight um, or excessive body fat. It, it correlates with metabolic disease, but it's still up for debate that which one is causing which, but there's yeah. a very high degree of correlation with obesity and typically when you're metabolically ill, you're hungry all the time and you're gaining body fat. So they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, and even uh, the term insulin resistant, how many times I, I get referrals from people that, yeah, the HPL for one c is good. It's like 5.5, but that can be for 10 years. In fact, there's studies for 13 or 14 or 15 years. You can have insulin resistance. Your body's pushing out all this insulin and hyperinsulinium is a cause of many, many conditions and uh, a cause of cancer, a cause of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is exponentially increasing. So uh, if you're listening out there, your fasting insulin is a very, very important marker, even if your doctor's checking your three-month glucose of HbA1c. And HbA1c has its limitations. We've spoken about this, especially on your iron profile, your hemoglobin, and your ferritin. But it is a marker that's important. But if you're listening out there, have your fasting insulin done because that's also part of metabolic disease so good so we know there's a crisis we know there's it causes significant problems and chronic disease let's look at what people really need to know about this disease and how the, what the other options there are to to manage this and prevent this disease that verta health offers yeah well maybe just to take a step back why i became a co-founder of, of verta health in the first place because it kind of answers in my opinion, how to address the disease. So as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, previous to Verta Health, uh, I started a company called Trulia, which is, is a tech company. It's an online real estate marketplace in, in the United States. So I come from a background of technology and studied physics. So I come from outside of healthcare. And I should have said that in the beginning that I'm not a medical doctor and I don't play one on the internet. So whatever I say about statistics and Metabolic health, I try to just back it up with data, but don't try to overreach. But in any case, so I come from a tech background. I was and hopefully still pretty high-performing endurance athlete, but you know, years ago did a lot of triathlons and the Hawaii Ironman seven times and won the world championships in, in my age group in triathlon. So it was a very, very fit. And this was year 2011. And if you had asked me then, how about let's go and solve obesity and type two diabetes? Because they are big problems, right? I would say, oh yeah, absolutely huge problems but let's be honest it's food it's nutrition so you can only blame yourself so if you get sick it's it's your hand and it's your mouth it, and your brain like it, that's your problem yeah. how do you solve that bottling willpower maybe well how, how do you bottle willpower so i probably would have rolled my eyes and said impossible there's no way you can solve type 2 diabetes and obesity because people are just lazy and western lifestyle whatnot um Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, that totally changed in my mind and my kind of perspective of what's going on here totally changed when I discovered that despite my fitness and leanness and exercise, I was on my way to type 2 diabetes myself and I was already pre-diabetic myself. And of course, that was, that was kind of like eating a very humble pie, uh, pun intended, <laughs> Like, wow, now it's me. And I, I thought it's all it's it's only the lazy people in, quote unquote, in America, middle, middle of the America who mm. are suffering from metabolic disease. But obviously I was completely wrong. 
completely wrong. And I would say in my own frustration and trying to get to the root of it, like what the heck's going on here? I met a couple of amazing scientists, Dr. Stephen Finney and Dr. Jeff Bollock and read their studies and research and met them. And and I, I guess I, I sort of concluded two things with them. One was obviously I was wrong. Diabetes obesity is, is not a personal choice. People don't just decide one day that, hey, I'm going to gain 30 kilos or 70 pounds and, and develop type 2 diabetes. So it's a metabolic disease. That's one. And then the second is really why we started Verda. The second aha for me, which I learned through these two amazing scientists, was these are not chronic irreversible diseases with the one-way street, particularly type 2 diabetes. Contrary to what we are told, and still too many people say, type 2 diabetes is not a miraculous chronic progressive disease where the best you can do is to slow down the progression and still likely die and deal with all the complications of dialysis and amputations and blindness. It is a reversible condition with weight, nutrition, with nutrition. If you can use nutrition in a way that it is not a willpower exercise, if you can use nutrition in a way that you don't have to be hunger and restrict yourself all the time. And guess what? It's possible to do that. And so long story short, when I discovered this and became convinced that this is true, I said, wait a second. We are sitting on a quote unquote secret. We have to get this out to the world. There's millions, actually, we just talked about billions of people now globally who needlessly suffer from type 2 diabetes and obesity. They try all these diet and exercise programs yeah, and they fail. And then the established medical system and providers, well, meaning the best they can offer is hey, a bunch of drugs to treat your symptoms. Yes. So I said, hey, let's go. We have to reverse type 2 diabetes and obesity because it's possible. And if we can figure out a way to deliver the care digitally through computers and through smartphones and telemedicine, we can scale it. We can do it cost effectively and we can reach millions of people, you know, not just a few hundred or a few thousand locally. So so that kind of led me into healthcare about now about 10 years ago, completely out of the blue. And and that's to kind of a long, long answer to your question that the key tool addressing metabolic disease or reversing it, not just addressing, is is nutrition. Yeah. And I think that's important. I'm going to reiterate that from my own clinical experience. It is reversible. If you're out there and you've heard your medical doctor or your endocrinologist say it's not reversible type 2 diabetes, it is. The stats are there. And it's really like amazing on your website, just looking at all the stories. And maybe you can just share the stats on Verta Health because I think people, you know, that are very number and data oriented want to know, you know, what percentage of improvement you get across the board because you've obviously scaled this, you know, I'm just one doctor in my rooms and maybe the other functional medicine doctors that we part of a group and we do functional medicine. Yes, we can help those patients and we use health coaches and we use data, but it's not scalable. You've taken this to a scalable model, which is amazing because you can help millions and millions of people. But Give us the stats, number one, and then maybe just share a common story of, you shared your own story. Tim Noakes, who was on the podcast, said that after all his marathons, he was skinny fat and he had type 2 diabetes. So this is a common problem because people are picturing, oh, you have to be overweight and you don't have to exercise. You have to be not exercising to get type 2 diabetes. No, you can be skinny fat and you can be an athlete and still get type 2 diabetes. So uh, share the stats and then just share two common stories, maybe a male and a female of a common sort of archetype who comes to Verta and then has reversal of type 2 diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I might also you know, share a, a few business statistics, although patient outcomes, clinical outcomes are all, but I sometimes, you know, people listen, they say, who is this guy? Maybe, you know, he has three employees and some sort of a corner shop somewhere to, to try to establish a little bit of credibility. So just yeah. as a company, you know, we've we've more than 100,000 people have benefited our treatments. We've raised $360 million of equity financing for the company. You know, we've generated more than 100 million in, in revenues. We work with more than 500 large payers, anything from, you know, large employers like United Airlines to large insurance companies like Blue Shield of California to government entities in the U.S., the Veterans Administration. Uh, we've been in a business for about nine years, commercially available, five years. Uh, we have about 600 employees as, as a company, and today we just focus on, on U.S. And roughly doubling 
each year in terms of the business wow. or patients we treat. So we're growing pretty fast. And so I would say, and we're still a privately held company, but probably in, in a position to go public in a, in a very foreseeable future, I would say. Again, the fact that we're a business, it's just a vehicle for change. And I truly mean that. The reason Verta exists is for our mission, which is reverse diabetes in 100 million people. And that's why I started the company. But obviously, business is the vehicle that allows us to scale and then make it self-sustaining. So I just wanted to throw out a couple of statistics to, to try to establish the credibility a little bit that we are not, we didn't start yesterday and we treat a couple of people. But again, to the most important thing. So in terms of outcomes, a uh, few statistics. So we actually ran a five-year prospective clinical trial and have published about a dozen peer-reviewed papers now. And the reason we did that wasn't because we needed regulatory approval or FDA approval. No, we are not a new drug. We use nutrition and telemedicine, and and we have providers. We employ providers, but you don't need regulatory approval when you use food or nutrition as as a therapy. But the reason we did the study is to be able to have conversations like this. Is to be able to have conversations with the government entities. Is to be able to have conversations with very credible Fortune five hundred companies and say this is real. The numbers that we say this is real stuff. So a few statistics. Um, First of all, if we just start from weight loss, our average weight loss on an intent to treat basis, this is average, not the best, is 13% of body weight at one year, Wow, which is remarkable. But what's even more remarkable is the same 13% is sustained at two years, uh, which is unheard of nutritionally. Uh, it's literally unheard of because most quote -unquote, diet exercise programs, you lose weight for three to six months and then it kind of creeps back by sort of nine, month nine or my, uh, month 12. So that, that's weight loss. Uh, in terms of diabetes metrics, um, we use a measure of uh, diabetes reversal. So nearly all of our patients improve, but 60% of our patients have achieved what we call diabetes reversal at one year, which compares oh. to close to 0% in standard of care. <laughs> And, and when we say diabetes reversal, some people like to use terms of diabetes remission. And But the bottom line is your blood sugar comes down to a normal level. And simultaneously, we have eliminated all diabetes-specific medications, which again is kind of thought to be impossible. Um, another metric, I like to talk about insulin because it's often thought as the kind of last hope drug. You have pre-diabetes, then diabetes your blood sugar control or blood sugar is out of control, then you're on insulin and it's thought to be like, okay, this is the end of the road. All we can do is increase your insulin dose. About 60% of all insulin doses are eliminated at one year. And from start to two years, 80% of insulin on, on an average is, is eliminated. Incredible. And of course, many people get completely out of it. Um, and then I'm not going to mention numbers, but I'll, I'll just give you an example. We talked about this metabolic disease, diabetes, obesity, and then a lot of these other things go around. But what we've been able to show in addition to weight coming down, blood sugar coming down, getting off of diabetes medications is the following. And this is all peer reviewed. So I'm not just making things up is um, hypertension. So blood pressure improves, cardiovascular disease, risk markers improve and lipids come down. Uh, inflammation as measured by CRP and white blood cell count comes down. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease markers improve. Kidney markers improve as measured by EGFR. So we've been able to take from 3B to 2, which is thought to be impossible. So reversing kidney disease markers, which is thought to be impossible nutritionally. Uh, sleep apnea improves. Uh, knee pain improves, perhaps unsurprising. Uh, depressive symptoms improve. This is our peer reviewed result. This is not one time anecdotes. Yeah. So I just wanted to. So those are some of the results. So the sort of the net net of it is that. When you address the underlying drivers of type 2 diabetes and obesity, nutritionally, very broad spectrum of metabolic markers and conditions improve, which goes to show that these are not, you know, eight different diseases. We're talking about one single thing, which is poor metabolic health. And then it has a number of these different symptoms. And unfortunately, in Western medicine, which I'm a huge believer in, we see them as different diseases. And so you go to the doctor, say, oh, high blood pressure, high lipids, high blood sugar, high weight. All right, I'm going to describe six different drugs to six different diseases, yeah. which is not true. 
<laughs> so anyway, so those are uh, population level results. Then in terms of individuals, um, well, first of all, you know, we've treated men, women, all ethnicities, socioeconomic status. We've also published results looking at different age, different ethnicities. And in America, we call it uh, Area Deprivation Index, ADI. So we can look at different socioeconomic status of people. And again, published published data, peer-reviewed. Um, no difference, no substantial difference in outcomes. So we've been able to be successful in all these different groups. Um, but maybe, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a gentleman in, um, let's see, I'm trying to think a good example of who, who to talk about. And maybe I'm not going to mention names, although some people have been in public, but, um, you know, the one gentleman comes to mind who, this is kind of an extreme outcome, but first he lost 80 pounds, then 100 pounds, then 200 pounds. And now he just ran his first 5K in his life. And, and you know, this gentleman is not very old, so just the, the middle age. Um, came in on, I don't know, somewhere between 7 and 10 different medications. This is also very common. And when people have type 2 diabetes only, it is usually two or so drugs for type 2 diabetes. Then they also have high blood pressure. Blood pressure. So you have a drug for that. There may be some depression, kind of mental health issues that go hand in hand. So there may be something for that. Then there may be water retention. There may be dirt. It's it's ridiculous. So most of these folks, including in this case, the person came with, um, you know, a good nearly dozen different drugs, and now he's off of all these drugs that were treating symptoms. So that's a typical story. But obviously, somebody losing two hundred pounds, which is almost hundred kilos, uh, 80, 90 kilos, uh, is is obviously extremely phenomenal outcome yeah. but that's just kind of what we see amazing wow that's incredible i just want to say well done because i think you're just changing many many people's sort of health and wellness and like you said it's the root picture or root metabolic cause of so many diseases that people are treating individually with different pharmaceuticals or even different natural medicine but it's coming from a root cause so let's let's uh let me know how you do this i mean your data centric model using biomarkers how you manage and, and use the tech and using a smartphone and then the human capital side of physicians and health coaches how do you integrate those two because at the end of the day uh, we do know that it's your mouth, your hand, and your brain, but big food is making it a lot more difficult. Uh, just big tech is making it a lot more difficult for people to to not uh, put on weight and develop these chronic diseases. Modern lifestyles are, you know, very, very, very hard to eat healthy. It costs more generally. It, it takes a lot more energy and effort often, and especially somewhere in South Africa here yeah, where it's so costly to eat well and eat healthy food and, and the time and energy. But let's talk about how your business model works and we can get into the nitty gritty of the details. Yeah, well, first, just again, I'll mention the business side first and then go into the patient experience. The, the business model is is actually, it's it's simple and complicated at the same time, but simple in that we go to the payers, so health insurance companies and in America, employers, self-insured self employers also cover the healthcare custom government, uh, some government entities. So we go to them and say, chronic disease diabetes is a huge cost item, which it is in America, it costs easily $10,000 per person per year extra if you have type 2 diabetes. So we go to these entities and say, we can help you solve diabetes. And guess what? In the process, you make money. Can you believe it? you as a healthcare payer, you make money and somebody's healthy, which is, by the way, very rare because usually there's a new intervention like a cancer treatment and it's very expensive. Yes, it improves outcomes, maybe life expectancy, but then you have this trade-off. Oh, are we going to cover $500,000 treatment to extend life by six months. Tough call. But when reversing chronic disease, it's a win-win-win. The patient wins. Um, you know, the payer wins. They save money and then Verta saves money. So that's basically the business model. The payer pays. And then for the individual suffering from type 2 diabetes or obesity, completely free. Completely free. So that's kind of the business model. But in terms of the patient experience, um, you know, there's many layers to it. So I, I try to kind of start from the top of the pyramid and then go into some details and then we can have a conversation. But on a high level, it is 100% individualized nutrition through lifestyle chains. So we don't sell food or ship things or potions or anything. It's, it's real food as much as possible through lifestyle chains, which means we can do it digitally. Um, 
So we help people to make the right choices. And then the other component is, of course, the care delivery, which is telemedicine, digital telemedicine, where we assign you a one-on-one -on -one coach who's one of our employees and a medical doctor who supervises, takes care of the safety and also deep prescription medicines such as, you know, STLTs, STLT2s and sulfonylureas in diabetes context or insulin. And then, of course, sometimes you may need to prescribe medications if it is an extreme case and they're totally uncontrolled. But I'd say 99% of the cases we are in a business of deprescribing medications as opposed to adding medications. But those are the two components, uh, nutrition through lifestyle chains and then the telemedicine and the support that technology and coaches and providers give you. How it works, a few of the core tenants are, one, you should never be hungry or fighting with willpower. And we achieve that with individual nutrition, but this one of the cornerstones is individualized carbohydrate restriction. Um, but that's a key tenant, that you should never be hungry and craving, because if you are, willpower runs out, you know, latest by the wedding photo, I guess. So, so, <laughs> runs out. so that's one. Second one is very high degree of individualization to your life circumstances. So what I mean by that is, you know, we're very successful with vegans and vegetarians. We're also very successful with people who eat burgers every day. We work with US Foods, which is wonderful Fortune 500 employer customer, but most of the employees are truck drivers. So they only have access to food on fast food or whatever roadside stop. So is it, it isn't an organic grocery store where they buy ingredients and then they're cooking on the back of their truck. No. Unfortunately, they only have access at, at a what you might call a suboptimal uh, food place. But we can still succeed with them. We have to succeed with them. So that's sort of the second tenant, that high degree of individualization, because one size fits all is guaranteed to fail with 99% of the people. And, you know, we work with Native American tribes. So you can imagine they eat very, might want to eat very different food than or a Caucasian stay-home mom or dad who is not working and is shopping at Whole Foods and cooking whatever organic meals, as, just as an example. So that's kind of the second second tenant. And then the third one is, if we think of the patient experience, is we have sort of what we call closed feedback loop. That is, we measure biomarkers on a daily basis, not just to adjust medications, but to know how your body is responding. Because, again, you know, how much you eat protein, how many carbs you can have, this and that. You really, you know this as, as a doctor, like everyone's metabolic health is different. You have a different genes, different age, different size, different sex. So we have to be able to individual. So we use this closed loop to objectively know if you are on track or off track. And based on that, we can make tiny, sometimes big adjustments on a nearly daily basis. And that allows us to kind of spin the wheel and keep the patient on the right track objectively. So contrary to this sort of traditional approach, which is, hey, here's like five foods to eat and five not to eat and see you in three months. Well, maybe by the third day, they are off track and they're eating all the wrong things and exactly. hunger and cravings come back. And so so those are some of the core tenants. But again, it's, it's nutrition through lifestyle chains and then kind of advanced modern care delivery, which is digital with humans on our side, supporting and helping you and rapidly iterating so when you combine those two things we've seen the results that we've mm -hmm. seen so the what is the nutrition the how is you've got support team telemedicine and the how is bi biomarkers so are you using cgms or how are you tracking people on a daily basis because for me that must be the secret source is that someone's getting feedback you know daily and saying hang on what you did yesterday or was good the day before wasn't and now your markers are going in the wrong direction not waiting weeks or months like you said you're giving feedback and sort of raising bells maybe an orange flag maybe a red flag or maybe a green flag saying listen well done you're on track you, you're doing well how does that work from the biomarker perspective yeah so we have a couple of biomarkers we uh track from blood blood which is sometimes it's a cgms and more often it is finger brick not because Fingerbrook is going to go better technology, but at least in America, the cost of CGMs just doesn't make sense to deploy them to every patient. But so some markers are from blood and we measure um, two things primarily on a daily basis. One is just blood glucose, which one is a good proxy to see if the blood glucose is actually coming down. But secondly, it is a critical safety marker for people with type 2 diabetes because adjusting medications is your blood glucose come down. 
naturally with nutrition and you on hypoglycemic drugs like insulin, you know this very well, you must lower the dose. Otherwise you have a hypoglycemia risk. So uh, blood glucose is one. We also me measure blood ketones because it's a good proxy for carbohydrate restriction. And then people who have hypertension issues and maybe are on blood pressure medications, we also give them a, a connected blood, blood pressure cuff. Uh, so we get blood pressure. We also monitor weight, although it is kind of a lacking indicator and uh, I say less of a focus for us. The trends are very useful, but as, as you and many listeners know very well, you can fluctuate, you know, two, three kilos a day, meaning, you know, four, six pounds a day, which is water retention and stuff like that. So you don't want to be too focused on that. But yes, yeah, it's some blood-based one, some uh, kind of subjective markers, hunger, cravings, how you're feeling, and then and then weight. And then on a, on a periodic basis, uh, we obviously, obviously also run comprehensive lab-based blood panels, but that depends on a patient, whether it's once a year or twice a year. Uh, but that's also essential for safety to see, because many of our patients are very, very sick when they come in uh, to see how their kidneys are doing and, and other things uh, that are related to adjusting medications. So let, let's take an example. Someone's in Florida. I think you guys are in California for what I understand. So now are they picking, taking their glucose three times a day and then uploading it to the cloud? Are they checking their blood pressure twice a day? And then they're on seven medication. Then you get feedback, goes to the health coach. The coach then says, hang on, the blood sugar is coming down, speaks to the medical doctor, says, hang on, you got to start. So is that what's happening? you got a dashboard on, on every single patient and they got to upload the data? Yeah, well, first, in, in terms of the California, Florida, um, our we're headquartered in Denver, Colorado. We have okay. a major office in California, San Francisco, where I started the company. And then, of course, now, with, well, I should say since COVID, we have employees in more or less all states because most of us work uh, work virtually. So, so, so that's a company. But obviously, for our patients, our providers, our doctors are licensed in all 50 U.S. states. So we have patients... Uh, throughout the United States, obviously sometimes they travel. So then we have international patients as well in, in that sense. But we have patients in 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 all states. In terms of how the data flows, um, again, I mentioned there's the, there's the lab data that maybe happens once or twice a year, or, or we can get your, your recent labs and that comes to our providers. Um, but the data, we use connected meters, remote monitoring tools. So whenever you track, it sort of uploads through Bluetooth uh, to our app and to our cloud and to our systems. And then, yes, you, you said it right. We basically have a profile of, of every patient. And then we use AI and software to prioritize them to our coaches and, and providers. And so the kind of qualitative term that I use is we give our providers and coaches superpowers with software and AI. We're not trying to replace coaches and providers for a number of reasons with software and AI, but we give them superpowers so that they can be much more productive. So if you're a provider, you have 1,000 plus plus uh, patients in your panel, most of them, as, as the medical doctor, you don't have to do anything on a given day, but there are a few people that you may need to adjust medication. So we use software to surface the quote-unquote critical patients to the provider, and same for coaches. Um, obviously, they interface much more intensively with all of their patients. But it's the same thing that depending on what's coming in, if they're on track, off track, the response has to be very different. And maybe you need mm. to pay, spend 20 minutes with someone today. And then there's a couple of folks that you don't have to worry about at all. So we use software to... So the care delivery, I guess I should say, the care delivery for our coaches and providers is not like a traditional model where you flip charts and you read everyone's chart and then you think about for a minute, oh, what do I do? Instead, the software is doing that. And then it's telling to a provider, hey, here's the three patients. Over the next six hours, we need to consider or you need to consider a medication adjustment. Uh, and here's the 20 patients who over the next week, you should probably give them a call or whatever it is. And then here's sort of 100 people who are kind of off the medications. They're doing well. Nothing to worry. If you want to look at them, you can, but there's nothing to worry. So that's kind of how we've been able to make it scalable and then also cost efficient. And for us to be able to make, you know, the ends meet that we don't spend too much money on on kind of looking at everyone's chart. Yeah, of course. Every and I mean, I think that's the scalability. There's the IP there on that software program to say, hang on, 
through years and years and years of initially probably research and then finding and then iterating and iterating to say, okay, this is a person, this is a red flag, you better watch them. You know, this is orange, you can watch them over the next week. Oh, you got to draw bloods in two weeks' time. So that software and that AI algorithm, I promise, is that's the most important there for people to to understand that they are being watched and they are being monitored and there is safety in the program. 100%. And I think you used the term iterate. That That's it absolutely key. It has been absolutely key for us as a company. Mm-hmm. And I like to say that every patient that we treat and all the data and experience we collect improves the treatment, experience and outcomes for the next one. And so we tried to kind of spin that wheel mm-hmm. um, over the last eight, nine years to constantly improve and use that data. And then the second point I, I wanted to make, because you also said it, uh, we do want to make sure that our patients know there's a coach and a provider who's actually making the final decisions. Yes, it's very clear we use software and AI, but we're not trying to have a bot that's spitting out, you know, uh, our responses automatically. And and it makes a difference. It makes an emotional difference, commitment difference to the patient. And then, of course, on a clinical decision side, we don't want software to be making clinical decisions. Yeah. It has to be human and a medical doctor who makes those. Right. And you've managed financially to, so a person working in Florida, they're working for a company there, the company's paying because they're self-insured, or if they, with a with an insurance plan, they're paying you guys, so it's free for the, the employee or free for the person in, sitting in Florida, and you've managed to come to a sort of financial monthly, uh, well, actually you don't, because from what I know, it's not uh, paying for service it's paying for results so maybe you want to unpack that because it seems like and and i suppose you've answered these questions like the impossibility of making this financially viable is 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 significant yeah a- absolutely so we like to say that we put our money where our mouth is so we put 100 percent of our fees at risk uh so when we work with and in, in florida just one example there's a florida blues health plan called florida Healthcare plan and many others that we work with. But yeah, that would be an example. So when we work with them, we say, hey, yes, bold promise, we can reverse diabetes and deliver sustained weight loss uh, nutritionally. It's a very bold promise, but guess what? You only pay for results. So if we don't deliver, if we can't engage and enroll people into the treatment, you pay nothing. And even if we can enroll, but we don't deliver certain results in terms of weight loss and blood sugar reduction and getting people off of unnecessary medications, you pay nothing. So it is kind of a value-based arrangement um, in which we take the economic and the outcomes risk. And by the way, that's how healthcare should be, in my opinion. Not that... But how are you you getting these patients to execute and be consistent and carry on uploading the data and making the changes? I mean, we just, we know that you've got this part of your brain, the amygdala, you know, it's the survival part of your brain and with these calories available, you just eat them. If you want to be lazy on the couch, you're going to be lazy on the couch. Well, what is the secret source there? Because I mean, you know, I've I've done over 140,000 treatments and to motivate people using internal or external drivers, I, I know the external drivers of data can be very, very powerful. I've seen that. But to get people motivated and to sustain that motivation so that the transformation is sustainable, which is what the data is showing, is is huge, is significant. Yeah, well, we make it work because it works. And (laughs) and they're not trying to be, uh, you know, obnoxious. But honestly, that's why patients stay and love it, because Berta works. They lose weight. They see the results. They get rid of medications. They may have been sticking the insulin needle into their bodies for years or decades 10 15 years and then in 30 60 90 days they're off of it and it 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 works and then hand in hand with that goes that the fact that you're not hungry you're not craving uh that that is the reason and as maybe as a one-way shortcut then i don't know if you want to talk about glp once but you know probably anyone and everyone in the world has heard the word ozempic we go be Munjara, but Ozempic, probably the most well-known brand, a GLP-1 drug, and this molecule or these molecules were approved for obesity about two years ago. And so they've kind of been in headlines. So, so one shortcut to use to explain why Verda works is Verda works for the very same reason as Ozempic works. And when you talk to people who are on, say, Ozempic, and we can talk about the side effects and whether it's actually the magic pill or injection for obesity, in our perspective, no. But people will tell you, oh, I'm not just, I'm just not hungry. I used to crave all these things. I don't crave, like, 
I'm just not hungry. I, I don't feel like I want to eat the seven donuts that I wanted to eat in the past. That is exactly what we can produce nutritionally. And so it's sort of a catch-all answer to say it works. You're not hungry. You're not craving. And that's why it's successful. Now, underneath that is obviously all the, you know, half a dozen things or dozen or hundreds of things I mentioned earlier, which is the support and nutrition science and individualization and closed loop and uh, coach accountability and safety and credibility by the provider. And all these things are contributors. But most fundamentally, people follow because it works and it works because it feels pretty effortless. It is not a matter of daily wrestling of the alligator um <laughs> i.e willpower okay wow it works and i mean if that's the case it sounds incredible you've obviously got some special sauce that mixed all together you know the, the whole process and you've seen it you know over time with different types of cultures creeds you know races uh, age groups uh, well done to you but let's go on to Zempic and Munjara and and tell us about the research outside of Verta because I know that uh, it's uh, I think being a tailwind in your in your business uh, Ozempic and, and these GLP-1 agonists and I think it's important because I get this question often the research that I've looked at is not promising um, with regards to long-term use of Ozempic especially on muscle loss and uh, you know everybody says you got to get people on an exercise program they don't lose the muscle I, I don't find people do that and they they lose muscle as well as losing fat but maybe give us uh, just the research on without verta and then what happens when people are on glp1 agonist and verta yeah well for, for those listeners who are a little bit newer to glp1 just very very briefly um they are not completely new drugs. So around 2005, at least in America, the first GLP-1 uh, class drug was approved by FDA for treating type 2 diabetes. So there's 20 years of experience uh, treating patients with GLP-1s, patients who are living with type 2 diabetes. Uh, so it is not a new. In fact, Verda, we have now nine years of telemedicine experience, mainly deep prescribing, in some cases prescribing GLP-1s, including Ozempic for patients with, with type 2 diabetes. And just as a side note there, has diabetes gone away? Is everyone living with type 2 diabetes now skinny and lean? Well, we can all roll our eyes and smile and say, of course not. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a good question to ask that we've had GLP once for 20 years for treating type 2 diabetes. Why is there just more diabetes? Why are the people living with type 2 diabetes even more obese? So clearly it, it didn't solve diabetes or you know, help people lose weight in our context. But that's a historic context. What's new is that these GLP-1 drugs, same molecules in many cases, were approved for treating uh, obesity about two years ago by FDA, at least in America. And the first molecule was semaglutide, which is brand name Ozempic for type 2 diabetes care and brand name Wigavi for weight loss. But it is the same molecule. The dose is higher when addressing obesity and weight loss. Um, so a couple, couple of things in terms of results outside of Verda. What's exciting about these drugs for obesity is that they actually work, full stop. They work to change how much you eat because your appetite goes down. They don't change what you eat. And that is a key, key thing. So short term, you do lose a huge chunk of appetite and you're not craving food, and hence people lose weight, which, as you mentioned, is often also lean body mass. But they work, so you lose weight. So that's sort of a good news. The other good news with these drugs is that relative to other weight loss drugs in the past, there are side effects, but the side effect profile isn't like you get a heart attack and you die. Like it, <laughs> The side effect profile is you know, nausea and gastrointestinal issues and all kinds of stuff, but they're sort of tolerable right way better than so that's the other good news so there's a lot to celebrate and high five and hence the pharma companies are kind of you know their stock prices are up and they're swimming in cash in in, in many ways so that's kind of uh the the good news outside of verda again and then i guess the kind of bad news is 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 the following with these drugs well one i would say is the 20 year history of treating type 2 diabetes we still have more diabetes people with diabetes are even more be look so it didn't solve the other bad news, perhaps the most important to, to highlight is in all the studies outside of Verda, even by the pharma companies like Novo Nordisk, which is a 
phenomenal Scandinavian company. When people come off these drugs, weight regains, weight regains. And it's less populist, but the data that if you dig in some of these studies is that people lose a ton of muscle, i.e. lean body mass, when they lose weight. But then when you regain, usually a larger proportion of that is fat. So that's kind of a danger. Well, it's a very dangerous cycle that you lose a bunch of weight. A huge chunk of that is muscle, which is the only thing that keeps you vital and burns calories while you sleep. Then you gain the fat back, but not so much of the muscle. So that is the one thing. So again, it comes back to this. You take these gelby ones, it absolutely changes how much you eat, but not what you eat. And if you don't change the what you eat, you end this yo-yo. So that's one sort of a bad thing. The second thing is um, obviously these other docu many documented side effects. And, and I'll just give you a couple of statistics from America. Um, so people often say, well, you regain weight. But this is a chronic disease drug. So just stay on it forever. Or, you know, that's what you should do. And obviously that's good business for the pharma companies, right? So it's a lifelong subscription to a quote unquote chronic disease drug. There's a couple of PBMs, pharmacy, pharmacy benefit managers and health plans that have published now data. What's the persistence on these drugs? So Verta had 84% of people stayed on Verta at one year in a clinical trial. Uh, Prime PBM is one large uh, PBM here in America. In their data set, they just published it earlier this year, only 27%, 27% of people who started a GLP-1 drug stayed on it at one year. Then there's other data from some health plans where less than 40% stayed for past, I believe it was 12 weeks or 16 weeks. So why is that? Well, there's obviously a number of reasons, but the bottom line is that in the real world, people are not staying on these drugs for very long. And all the data suggests is once you come off, you regain the weight. Yeah. So that's a huge problem. So then what is it? it is it a vanity short term? Lose some pounds for your wedding photo or summer or, or and that's not, you know, that's not very beneficial for long term health improvement. No, nor do uh, insurance companies want to cover a drug for three months. It's crazy expensive. That then doesn't actually deliver the health outcomes long term. Um, so that's kind of outside. And then let me pause there. I'm, I'm happy to talk about what we do in obesity in GLP-1 context, what our clients are asking. But uh, did that answer your question? No, absolutely. And it's the same, just what I call, you know, empirical evidence that I have here is that short term, yes, long term, not good. And for, you know, a number of reasons, people don't stay on it. And it, uh, I think, causes more problems in the long term because people get this false sense of, oh, I'm losing weight. It's great. It's exciting. They don't change the what. And then when they don't change the what, it just returns back or they don't change their lifestyles or they don't put the things in place that they need to. And, and I think it's unhelpful for most. And I'm not saying it, I mean, there's a, there's a small, you know, portion of my patients, you know, empirically that have done well with them. But the risk reward, I think, is in favor of risk, not reward. And I think we've got to understand that. So if you've got a small reward, you know, out of a huge risk, I, I think that needs, you know, to to be publicized and patients need to know that the risk is greater than the reward and significantly greater. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I would completely agree. And then in terms of what's then happening by the payers uh, in, in the US, so like I mentioned, we work with more than 500, either Fortune 500 employers who cover healthcare costs or health plans or some government entities like VA. And um, last year, this year, 2024 and 2023, was just ridiculously busy for us. And I could I should say good for our business because of these GLP-1 drugs. And the reason is these payers are coming to us asking the same questions you asked, which is one, clearly I can't just make available this and be handing out GLP-1 like candy because it's expensive, because people can't tolerate, then weight comes back. And so come and help us because we also can't just block them because then we, you know, that's not clinically or ethically the right thing to do. And then our employees hate us and we're going to be crucified in the press and whatnot. So come and help us. So basically that's been the question for the last, I'd say 18 months, like how can you, Verda, help us address obesity? And we have to address it because these drugs now exist and there's a lot of social media stuff and the costs are high. And so basically we do two or three things with these health plans. And this is, what I think is the best in class 
quote unquote holistic holistic approach to addressing obesity and it's the following number one is always an evidence-based nutrition treatment that that is the first line of defense if someone's obesity struggling with obesity make something like verda available number two for the small group that may not want to or may not succeed with nutrition. And let's be honest, nothing in medicine is 400%, like this always. So then you have the second line of defense. And it can be the GLP-1 drug. Certainly it should be, it should not, these GLP-1 should be before bariatric surgery. And so, they, you know, they're cheaper and easier and likely safer. So then you can have these drugs. But with the drug, you have to address the what you eat, not just how much you eat. So as is required at least in america by the fda in the label of this drug you have to have a nutrition program coupled with this drug not just throwing the drug over the fence so that's the second thing we say okay we can be the responsible prescriber our providers and then we can use the nutrition treatment in parallel so that's the second thing as part of this holistic way to address obesity and then thirdly those people who are on on the glp ones from day one you need to have an off-ramp strategy like we see in data, people come off, you mentioned. But you, it can't be, we just stop it, and then we see the weight regain. So this is something I can sort of brag about our data. I think we're the only company in the world that has published peer-reviewed results sustaining weight loss for a year or more after people are completely off placenta, sustaining the same weight loss they have. So it is possible, again, if you have the right kind of evidence-based nutrition program and support to maintain that weight loss that you've achieved. But you have to address what you eat early in the course of taking exactly. these drugs. And so, so that's basically what we've been doing. So nutrition is the first line of defense. Then small group of people who require or should be eligible for these drugs have a responsible prescriber who prescribes. And then a wrap around that is the what you eat. And then the off-ramp strategy. How do you get people off and how do you sustain nutritionally? And I think... Fast forward five years, that's what most of the world is doing. And that's, it, it's sort mm. of common sense, quite honestly. Mm. But uh, <laughs> that's not what you get from social media. Like, take this drug and everything's exactly. going to be well and good forever. Exactly. Well, Dangerous. it's not quite that. No. And and so what happens if, if you get the results, they pay you. If you don't get the results, they don't pay you. But if someone's not compliant with the program, do they come off the, say, the employer's paying or the medical insurance company's paying, then they, they stop the program if they're not compliant? Uh, how does the sort of the payment and compliance structure work? They actually go hand in hand. And then first I should say the sort of complying and staying on Verda, it's, it's pretty explicit for us because we are a provider. We have medical doctors. So you know this, that you probably don't want to have a patient who's like, yeah, I'm your patient, but you haven't heard of them for three months or six months. So you know nothing. You're like, I have medical liability on your health and safety. If you, you I don't hear from you, you don't do your labs. I don't get your, bar like, I know nothing about you. Like I'm going to formally, unfortunately terminate my physician patient relationship. So, because we are a provider, we have basically very strict criteria that if we haven't heard from you for a certain number of days, you're not responding, you're not doing what we're asking. It, it, so it's very binary. Unlike some you know, consumer companies where, and you know this, like you subscribe something to online, it's like you can't get rid of that subscription. Like you need to click 17 times and then you need to call and then six months later, they're still billing you. That is not Verda. So we have a very explicit, you're either our patient or not. And if you are our patient, we get paid, but we also have to be absolutely knowable and we have to know what's going on with you in terms of biomarkers and other things so that our providers can feel confident that they can care of your safety and outcome. So yeah. that's how it works. Then, well then in addition to this engagement, of course, there's certain level of outcomes we need to see and our clients need to see. Otherwise, we actually don't get paid. So we're basically doing free work, which is, again, how it should be. We're not in a business of just waving our hands. The reason I started the company and how the business would work is if we if we make you healthy or healthier by a high bar, wonderful. That's why we exist. If we don't do that, like don't pay us. Uh, and I'm so I'm kind of proud that we have that model. And I, I would, uh, in many ways, I wish that more of the healthcare would move towards that direction. Brilliant. Look, I think you've answered everything. You know, are there any sort of you've seen any risks with the program and any issues? Because I know some people are going to say that risk averse. Is there anything that you've seen that's been untoward, that's been unhelpful with the journey of iteration? Uh, in terms of as, as a business or company, how we've... Uh... 
Yeah, just with your patients and your clients, has been any risk or side effects or problems that people? Oh, I see. I see. Um, well, I, I mean, honestly, and it, I'm not trying to oversimplify, but the one thing we know practically universally, that we know the side effects of healthy food. It's good, happy, long life. Yeah. What are the side effects of drugs? Some we know and some we don't know. We just discover mm -hmm. later. So on, on a very kind of a high level, I would say, no. and obviously we've published and all the results and we've tried to be very evidence-based, but let's be honest, like we know the side effects of healthy food, none. It's good life, happy life, long life. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we are dealing with food. But I would say in addition to that, given we treat very, very sick patients, like we and our providers have to be on our toes all the time. Not because the Verda treatment in any way has quote unquote side effects, but when you take people who are on, you know, 150 units of insulin a day, their blood sugar sign like, you know, 250 milligrams of deciliter when they come in and A1C 11 or something like that. These are kind of extreme cases. We are responsible for their health and they are very sick to come in. So it, it, it's, it, it takes precision. It takes attention to detail. It, it takes, Mm. A lot of work to make sure that we ensure the patient's safety. But the fundamentals of using nutrition to improve their health, it's like you you, you can't really go wrong wrong mm. with that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, last question. Give a message of hope for people because chronic disease is just escalating from the cancers to the cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative conditions. There's a lot of people, anxiety, mental ill health. We're in big corporates now in South Africa and Africa and beyond. It's just, just chronic disease escalating and, and people are in absolute like, despair about it. But let, let's you, you've looked at the numbers and you've got a huge company. Just leave a message of hope for people listening out there. 100%. So I will say anyone suffering from type 2 diabetes and obesity, the number one thing to remember is it's not your fault. It is not your fault. And I see we hear a lot of self-shaming. Oh, I've, I've, I've failed 15 times. Maybe I don't have what it takes. It's my fault. And unfortunately, that's the message we hear even from authorities decision makers, policy makers, sometimes even doctors. That is not true. So the number one hopeful message I want to say to everyone is if you're suffering from type 2 diabetes obesity, it's not your fault. The second hopeful thing is there is a way out of it. These diseases are reversible. You can do it with nutrition. Uh, if you have the right support, the right science, as shown by Verda example, and you can find others, I'm sure, in South Africa because we're not yet there, it is possible to improve and likely reverse these conditions. And yes, it takes some effort. But with the right approach, it is not a heroic effort of exercising willpower. Anyone can do it. Like, I literally mean it. Anyone can do it with the right science and support, and it's absolutely doable. And then thirdly, I'll just kind of what always it just sort of blows my mind away, and I, hopefully this gives a sense like how transformative it can be for anyone who's suffering. I have this T-shirt, this Verta Health T-shirt. I have this. We call it Spark. This is our logo. We now have not one, not two, not three, but many Verda patients who have permanently tattooed this Spark logo in their bodies after we reverse their chronic disease. Wow. Mind-blowing to me personally as a founder, and it's like just I get like shivers when I think about it, but it shows to me that the experience of getting rid of a thing that you are told that this is going to be with you forever and your quality of life sucks. When you get out of that, it is like, oh, I got a second chance in life. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for those words. Just wanted to clear favor, blessing, and just blow wind in your sails. Sami, you did incredible work. You're changing a lot of people's lives and uh, 100 million people reversing diabetes. That's, uh, that's a wonderful, audacious, hairy goal. And we need more of those those goals out there. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for Verta. And uh, yeah, I look forward to partnering and collaborating with you uh, just now and uh, offline. Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve.